Yes, hello everyone, and uh, thanks uh, Grant for organizing, and uh, I'm happy so many could join. Uh, apparently, in the Seabird world, you just have to say wind farms, and uh, everyone, everyone is there. <laughs> so we know, we, know, we know the trick now. Um, the, uh, the, th the first paper we discussed today is uh, indeed on the effects of uh, offshore wind farms on uh, seabird abundance. And uh, it's a paper led by uh, Verena Peschko, um, Stefan Garte and their colleagues from the uh, Research and Technology Center of the University of Kiel. And the center is actually based in Busum in Northern Germany. Uh, to give you a bit of a background, um, in Europe, existing wind turbines have a total capacity of over 200 gigawatts, and those already cover 15% of the electricity consumption of the 28 EU states. Uh, you may think in this game, you know, that Denmark is big or the UK. Well, no, actually Germany is the undisputed leader uh, with a total of 61 gigawatts of installed capacity, followed by Spain with 26 and the UK with uh, 24. At the scale of Germany, this represents 30,000 wind turbines, uh, of which 1.5 thousand are at sea in 26 wind farms uh, with a total capacity of eight gigawatts. And there might be many more coming because the European Commission estimates that up to 450 gigawatts of offshore wind power is needed by 2050 to, click, to keep climate change um, temperature increase below 1.5 degrees C, according to the, uh, to the Paris Agreement. Uh, most of those could be installed in the North Sea. Uh, that's because the North Sea is not only windy, it's also very shallow. Uh, some of the existing wind turbines are over 100 kilometers offshore in northern Germany, and yet the water depth there is only 30 to 40 meters. So they're easy to anchor into the seabed. Uh, but anchoring and, and operating these wind turbines strongly modifies the seascape above and underwater with a lot of different effects and potential impacts, including on seabirds. And this has been part of the scientific discussion for a while now. Um, determining when, where wind turbines should be placed to uh, minimize impact and then assessing their um, consequences for seabirds has been indeed a hot topic and, and the group uh, led by Stefan Garte is a leader in this field. Wh why is it so? Well, that's because already 10 years before people even mentioned wind turbines, uh, Stefan was already spending his time on vessels all across the Southern North Sea uh, to count seabirds at sea and studied and understand what shaped their distribution patterns. Uh, today, his group is about to publish in uh, Marine Environmental Research um, a study which is based on nearly two decades of Guillemot and Kittiwak observations of the island of Helgoland, um, which allowed them to study wind farm effects uh, using a, a, a Bacci approach. So Bacci is in Italian for many kisses, uh, but in a scientific publication, uh, it's, uh, it means before after control impact. Uh, that means that observations were made before wind farms were operational and afterwards. Um, the observations were performed from vessels, uh, but also from planes, some of them flying at uh, 185 kilometers per hour, only 76 meters above the sea level. Is that reasonable? I was, I was happy to, um, to hear that other observations were made using VTO recordings on planes which were flying much higher at a 500 meter altitude. The uh, authors observed seabirds in the spring uh, before the breeding season, as well as during the birds uh, breeding season on Helgoland. Uh, they combined all this information in a big analysis and they um, demonstrated two important things. The first is that the relative density of kilomots and kittiwakes was nearly cut by half within the wind farm areas except for kittiwakes in the spring. And they also showed that the distance at which the birds reacted to the presence of wind farms varied according to species and seasons uh, with a nine kilometer response radius for guillemots in the spring and a 20 kilometer response radius for kittiwakes during the breeding season. To me, this all points to a significant habitat loss, uh, but the study also underlines the complexity of assessing wind farm effects on birds in the longer term, 
especially since the spatial ecology and the populations are at the same time affected by other global changes, uh, su such as climate change, impact on prey, competition with fisheries, etc. Uh, but the authors also stress the difficult situation specifically for the kitty wake, uh, which has declined globally by 50% during the last 20 years, and is also not doing so well at the uh, Helgoland breeding site. Um, the authors warn that any additional mortality due uh, to collisions with wind turbines would be unsustainable in terms of uh, population viability uh, for this species. Uh, so congratulations on, uh, to the authors uh, for performing this study. Um, I, was, I was very interested in reading it. Um, obviously, it's a very complex field with uh, a lot of current uh, studies. And, uh, and in the introduction of the paper, uh, you, you show that previous studies on Kittiwake and Guillemot uh, response to the wind farms showed contrasting results. Uh, sometime with no impact, um, sometime with uh, the birds avoiding the areas. So, so I, I, I guess the, um, the first logical question in this context is how um, generally applicable do you think the, uh, the findings of your study could be uh, about this general question? And I'll, uh, I'll unmute you guys. I think I've got Verena and Stefan are here. There we go. Hi, Verena. Hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting us. <laughs> We're happy to be here. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> and, I, and I hope, uh, so first, first maybe, um, uh, was, uh, was I accurate also about the conclusions of the paper? Or did, did I take uh, shortcuts where you, you think, you know, you may want to, uh, to correct or add information? Um, no, for me, it sounds fine. <laughs> Yeah, okay. so no, that's, uh, was good. <laughs> it was a good introduction, thanks. <laughs> and, and then I, I guess the, the sense of, of my general question, you know, about uh, how applicable these results are, uh, I, I guess my idea behind this is that, um, do you think that it will be important to perform such uh, long-term studies at, uh, at all the sites? Because, you know, the response of the birds could vary from site to site. Uh, or, or are there general conclusions uh, you think could be drawn from this analysis? Um, I think first of all, it's uh, the point is that um, we studied the effects uh, in the breeding season and the most of the, the um, studies we cited in the introduction are like, they, they more um, have a look on, on the whole year. So that's, mm. the, that's the thing about, um, our study, so that's the first thing I would say. So um, this is really helpful to get an idea of the possible impact in other areas closer to, to breeding, um, breeding sites, um, to get an idea about that. So um, that's the first th thing. And um, yeah, I guess, I mean, it's, it's always depending on the, on the speci site specific um, foraging opportunities for the birds and everything. But I would say that, I mean, <laughs> it's, you don't have to do such a study in every site, but um, I mean, it would be good to get more data or more studies like that, and or maybe not like that, not in the, the length of the study, but um, yeah, to get more studies um, focusing, if possible, fo focusing all, also on the different seasons so that you then we, that we can more disentangle the um, different effects which wind farms can have in the different seasons. So that's, yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I, um, I would be curious also to, to have a little more background on, on why you know, a wind farm was installed so close to Helgoland. So the, the, the closest is, is 23 kilometers north of Helgoland. Yeah. Uh, and, and you would think, you know, that there, there was information about what the birds were doing, or at least, you know, people could estimate this before the wind farms were there. What, what, was, what was the procedure uh, there? How, how, did, how did this happen? Actually, I think Stefan could maybe answer that a bit better yeah, sure. because he was involved <laughs> in, <laughs> yes. in that more yeah, longer that sounds, time than me. <laughs> that sounds logical. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, when I started in Busum 2001, my former director told me, you do this 10 years, then we know everything and you do something else afterwards. So I'm doing a lot of other things now, 
but I will be involved for the rest of my working life in wind farms. And so this is a continuous process. And actually uh, in the year 2000, the first discussion started in Germany and um, we could relatively early get rid of wind farms in the coastal zone. So actually we have very few in the um, um, territorial area that uh, extends up to 12 nautical miles. So these 23 kilometer uh, away from the coastline. But in the EEZ, we, in the, uh, which Germany is responsible for, we had lots of applications and they were decided by the respective uh, federal agency side by side based on consultancy work for each specific site. And um, usually they did not look much at the overall distribution patterns of birds. So the consultancy reports for these wind farms north of Helgoland said like there's a no no uh, significant, no uh, considerable effect on the marine wildlife in generally. And so in general, so uh, they said, uh, we give green light for these wind farms. We wouldn't have chosen a site so close to Helgoland, uh, but um, uh, they th said like, this doesn't matter too much. And um, one interesting part with this specific site is that this was the, the, where these three wind farms are located were part of what I suggested as a special um, protection area e according to EU bird directive in the year 2003. And the uh, ministry changed my scientific recommendation and introduced a right angle uh, in the southernmost part, which exactly is the place where these wind farms are placed now. Mm. So uh, this is a very interesting specific case, not necessarily because only of the birds of Helgoland, but also because the scientific suggestion has been uh, slightly adopted to obviously economic or climate related activities. And, and so far, this is one of the uh, most interesting uh, interactions between uh, politics and, and ecology. And these 23 kilometers are just because this is the shortest distance in the EZ close to Helgoland at a suitable, still suitable water depth at the time they decided upon this. And, and now when you, when you find that, you know, the existing um, wind farm there does have a, a, an impact on, on the birds. Uh, first of all, I find good, you know, that you can publish and communicate on this aspect, but uh, what, what, what sort of consequences um, uh, downhill do you, do you expect of the, of the findings? I think that they, the, uh, the uh, authorities took quite or really listen to us in our pre-recommendations and now also when we look into the effects. So uh, we could so far avoid most of the wind farms in the protected areas. And as I said, most of the wind farms in the, uh, uh, in the zone of highest interest in the, in the coastal waters. And uh, especially the, the um, red-throated loons, red -throated divers, which are part of, of the strongest problem that we have in the area. All those wind farm applications that came later have been um, motivated to go outside the, uh, the, the key area. The current problem is, and that's in a problem where we all are now heavily involved, is that according to the uh, EU climate uh, targets, Germany decided to realize 40 gigawatts in germ EZ waters. And we have eight, as you said before. So this means five times what we have now. And this would require to cover almost the whole EZ with wind farms. And at that time and moment, now we have the discussion, do we really want to have no wind farms in protected areas? Uh, and uh, where can we place these 40 gigawatts? So the success that we could be contributing to for all uh, so far is now under, under uh, substantial risk because if you want to put this climate target as the highest priority, then you would that would require that more or less the whole water uh, area would be covered if you take some areas out for shipping. Mm, no, really interesting. And then one last question before I hand over to Grant and, and uh, the wide audience today. Um, in, in France, we're just at the beginning of a similar process. Um, and so as, as scientists, uh, we are being asked to uh, you know, uh, answer to certain questions about the distribution of seabirds and potential uh, wind farm impacts. Uh, what would be your advice to, uh, so to say, a beginner in this field? Um, I think it's if you start uh, new, then you should have a priority of 
or you should have a look at the different species and the different habitats. And you should make clear that um, you are not occupying certain habitats or water depths, distance to coasts or whatever, uh, completely with wind farms. So you should um, at least have some areas uh, not covered by wind farms. And also, just from the from the principal idea, I think there should be no wind farms in protected areas because if you introduce economic uh, economically driven utilizations of such areas, that's totally against the basic idea, even if those, this would be legally allowed. Uh, but that that would be good if you keep the protected areas free at least, then you have a certain retreat area for such sensitive species. And at the same time, if you keep them also clear from fishing, then you have also a very nice place where uh, fish stock could partly at least or locally recover. So that's mm -hmm. a strong recommendation. And um, you always should also have a look at the overall pattern. So each single wind farm might not be a problem to a species, but if you say this for all the wind farms and you cover the whole area, this cannot work anymore. So you mm. always have to look at the cumulative effects and not only at a single site. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, well, congratulations again to, to Verena and to you for this study and also the, uh, the rest of your, of your work. It's uh, very nice to have you online. Over to you, Grant. Great. Thanks for that. That's uh, thanks for that, David and Stefan and Verena. Thanks for the paper. Uh, obviously, this is this is an area that I've been I've been working in over here in the UK, and uh, and I'm, I'm quite. You might be know might know that I'm quite familiar with the the recent data that were taken around Helgoland. Um, but the uh, I I guess I have a couple of quick questions. I won't make them technic too technical. I but, but I do I would like to email you at some point about some more technical questions I have, but. Uh, Broadly, I was wondering, have you looked at whether or not there were um, shifts in fisheries or anything like that that might account for the, the, the shift in distribution in the birds? For example, if the, if the birds are tracking fisheries and fisheries have moved away because uh, of, of an in, um, a wind farm being put in, have you, have you looked at that in any way? And along those lines, have you looked at whether or not there's actually been a, an ocean uh, or a, a regime shift? In the environment that may have caused the, uh, the movement of the birds versus the the wind farm. So, in other words, have you tested other hi other hypotheses? Um, yeah, actually, um, we didn't uh, include these factors in the in the analysis in this analysis um, because the analysis was already quite complex. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we tried to tackle this topic like like that now. Um, but this is actually, it's really interesting uh, things um, that you mentioned. Um, uh, one thing uh, regarding the fisheries, I could say that um, there is um, a small report in Germany, which, which had a look at fisheries around wind farms and um, yeah, fisheries in the area. So there we could see that um, actually the fisheries didn't move anywhere else, but they stayed actually quite close to the wind farms. So, um, so that, that's something I could rule out for, for sure, like not for sure, but I can say now that uh, there's, that it's not like the fisheries moved somewhere else and the birds with them. So that's, that's the one thing. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and the re regime shift, we, we um, didn't have a look at that as well. Um, but um, yeah, so the, the general, um, uh, distribution of the birds didn't change like completely before and after. So we had a look at the distribution, and um, so this was so this already shows that that's not it's not a like the birds now move to the east and before they move to the west or something like that. So the general distribution is similar. So that's something I can answer to that question <laughs> for now. But yeah, we can go in more detail later if you want. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure I'll drop you an email at some point. For yeah. Sure. That's very curious cool. about the, the way you've uh, applied the, the generalized additive models. So um, the, other, the other question that I kind of had uh, revolves around the, um, and I, I might've missed this in the paper, across the whole study area, was there um, a change in the population size or, um, or have you looked at it only with regards to uh, the distribution? We, we um, no, uh, we didn't. We didn't um, 
analyze the, the abundance values, the, the absolute abundance values. We only use the relative abundance because yep. um, that's um, yeah, that's part of the Baki analysis that we that we did. And um, yeah, we were in this paper. It was not for us. It was not possible to to calculate absolute abundance differences before and after because we had different methods before and after the um, the wind farms were constructed. But this was not um, like in the Baki approach, you compare relative differences before and after. So we don't need to have a look at the absolute abundance values. So, yeah. And I can add that the breeding population on Helgoland has not changed so strongly in the periods that this might be a factor responsible for the changes. We had ups and downs, but uh, there's no major shift in, in the one or the other direction. Right, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, all right. I, I don't think I'll, I'll ask too many more questions so I can open up to the audience because I'm sure there are there might be one or two people out there who have a question. Um, so I'm just wondering, actually, I do see a question from Tom Evans down in the chat who's asked, will fish recover in wind farm areas um, with larger turbines and higher turbine spacing? It may be possible for fishing vessels to operate within wind farms. Um, also, the ecosystem structure uh, with a de facto MPA wind farm may be different. Um, so, I'm just trying to get to the question here. I think it revolves mostly around whether or not there's any indication that fish species would recover in a wind farm area. And Tom, you can correct me if I've if I've missed the mark on that. And I, I wonder if Stefan, if you if you've had any experience with that at all, or have heard anything along those lines. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, we didn't include that in the study, <laughs> but um, from other studies, it's known like, um, I mean, there's a reef effect that's probably every, everyone knows. Um, but in the end, um, the, the prey species, like the, the effect or the, the reef, no, the effect on the prey species is not, um, it's not like um, yeah, sand eels are like, it's like a nice, really, or sand eel um, density increases too much in the, in the offshore wind farm area. So for the prey species for this, uh, for kitty wakes and guillemots, um, it's not a um, very obvious effect for now. So, and also the, so we can't say that um, the, the uh, density, like, or that the, um, birds will increase in the future for now. And so this is not, um, um, yeah, it's not something we can say for now, but we have to, to wait for more years of data to, to find and to maybe see some effect like that, like the, the increase of the, the fish in this area. So, if, yeah. if, it's, if, it's like, uh, if it's like Stefan uh, mentioned, you know, that you're blocking off the all of the EEZ with, uh, with wind farms, um, de facto, you know, you, you create a, a no-take zone for many fishing operations. That would be yeah. good, but the problem is that there's a lot stronger discussion now that there will be passive fishing going on in the wind farm, so there will be no, op no options for trawls because of the risk of, of uh, collision, but the, the pressure from the fishy, fishery side to uh, put in the passive, so set nets and anything like this, becomes stronger, so we, we might have uh, a in a slightly negative effect because of taking uh, taking away the the uh, increasing number of fish, and we might also, in that such a situation, get an another negative effect for the birds if we have uh, set nets as potential risk for birds entangling in these. So that's a discussion that is not the strongest at the moment, but uh, I heard that because fishery is general under pressure, of course, everywhere, that uh, they said like, uh, that would be a good place. And then we can reduce the active trawl fishery, which people are very worried about because of the um, uh, damage on the sea bottom. And so introduce set nets. So many people like this. And then from the bird side, we have to say again, like, oh, there's another problem here. Mm. Um, and it's also that um, if the if the fisheries approach the wind farms really closely, which which we seen in um, in the German North Sea already, then the birds are also attracted to the wind farms, which might cause more collisions. So that's something we have to consider as well. <laughs> yep. Oh. Really. We have a question in the uh, chat. 
Uh, with the decline in seabird populations globally, did you account for such decline before and after in the before and after analysis of the two species? Um, so, um, no, but I think we answered that question before, mm. right? Yeah, yeah, with regards to yes. relative abundance. Yeah, I think Stefan answered, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then down below again, how, how does the German Environmental Ministry how is the how the German Environmental Ministry perception of your results? How is that related to the increase of wind farms in the future? So now that they know, now that based on your results, now how will will you do you think that there's any indication that that will influence um, whether or not they're going to put in more wind farms? Probably me, me again. Um, <laughs> there's an, in, there's an in, um, intense discussion going on in the environmental ministry at the moment because between the climate uh, department and the nature conservation department. And it seems like the climate department is stronger and has stronger influence on the, um, on the leading persons in the ministry. So they say they see what we find, but uh, lots of people say uh, we have to take care of the climate so and we don't care about single species so if we lose the loons or if we lose the guillemots or one or the other species that's part of the overall game that's acceptable at the moment there's a discussion on whether we can say how how much such an ecological system can um, can still carry without collapsing uh, but uh, we, if we have to prove at what level the number of wind farms is too much or still acceptable, uh, which we of course cannot in any, in any um, uh, solid way, uh, then the discussion means that uh, the, the uh, climate targets are set higher than the biodiversity targets. Yeah, and it's coherent with the media also uh, communicating much more about the climate crisis than the uh, biodiversity crisis. Yeah, and, and most of the NGOs actually are, uh, are um, targeting even higher uh, targets than 40 gigawatts. And so it's, it's just the one or two NGOs that worry about biodiversity, but most of the, of the uh, important or of the, of the very visible NGOs are, are asking for such climate targets and don't care too much about biodiversity. And, and, and this development in, in uh, wind farms, um, that's, uh, that's also going forward despite the fact that you, you, you need a, a huge, so to say, backup system uh, mainly based on, on natural gas uh, to, supply, to supply the whole system at, at the scale of, of Germany. You see, yeah. you see what I mean? Because, you know, just, just wind farms, uh, that, that doesn't really solve the, the problem because, uh, you yep. know, you, you don't have a sustained production. You have to back up with something. Yeah, we, we don't have much light in summer either. So we, we cannot do any anything like solar power very much. And uh, we mm. don't have you, we don't have mountains, so we don't have rivers that, that produce uh, water power. And uh, wind farms on land are already so widespread and people are really worried in, in lots of the local communities that uh, the, the politicians say like there's no backyard where people might be worried about out at this at sea so this is the area where there are least um, uh, contrast responses by the public and so we simply mm. go for that because no one is uh, th that's the easiest solution of all mm. interesting yeah, it's, it's, it can get quite political obviously the discussion could uh, is still still going on it's quite intense yeah um, if there are no questions from the audience no more questions from the audience we should probably uh, move on to the next paper. And I'm not seeing anybody frantically waving their arms or throwing cues at their cameras. So I think we're probably okay to move on. Thank you, Verena. And thank you, Stefan, um, for joining us. That's, uh, that's really interesting. Joanna has one question, it seems. Oh, do. Oh, oh, yeah, she does too. Look at that. Hello, Joanna. How are you? Uh, I just I just wanted to ask one thing. It's been 10 years since I really looked at the wind farm question. But then the height the height and type of the of the towers was extremely important. Is that still holding true? And is there one type that looks like it's better for birds? Um, the uh, from from the seabird point of view, it's usually the way that the higher the um, 
the operating zone of the rotors are, the better for seabirds because, because they can fly underneath. And uh, large gulls are overlapping substantial with the rotor active zone, and uh, but lots of other seabirds are flying at much lower altitudes. So in that sense, setting the whole thing higher up is a good solution. But we have the problem with the bird migration on the other side, which is also quite intense in these waters. And uh, then you, with higher uh, uh, rotor zones, you kill much more or you take a, uh, have a much higher overlap with the bird migration. So uh, the question is, um, yes, it is important, but there's, again, no easy solution in that sense. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Joe. Is there anybody else who wants to ask a question? Not seeing any hands. All right. Thank you very much. And David, I think we should move on to the next paper. Now, uh, we couldn't get a hold of the authors of the next paper to, uh, to join us today. So David and I have decided to devise a new method of of talking about a paper. David is going to introduce a little bit about storm petrol tracking and uh, and then I'll talk about the uh, the paper that we uh, we've picked out here um, that's tracking European storm petrols in the Mediterranean. Um, and then we'll hopefully ask some relatively wide questions um, to uh, instill some discussion amongst the group. Ideally, we have a, a nice open uh, open discussion. So I'll, I'll allow you to unmute yourselves during that. Um, and then we can, uh, if you have any questions or concerns or anything you'd like to bring up, um, that would be lovely. And so David, I think we'll start with your introduction to the issues with storm petrol tracking and, um, and then I'll, I'll bust in with this uh, paper description. Yeah, I, th I felt that, you know, after uh, dealing with wind farms, uh, we needed a second part, um, which was slightly um, uh, lighter hearted. So, um, and, um, of course, storm petrels are absolutely fascinating as um, as seabirds, and uh, as we were, you know, with Stefan and with many others, um, um, experimenting with with tracking devices, you know, first with with TDRs um, and then with GLSs and then with GPSs, PTTs. You know, there was always this frustration that you you start with a, a really large species, you know, and uh, and of course, it's no accident that uh, most of the pioneering studies uh, were performed, you know, on wandering albatrosses and then gannets and then the, the large penguins. So there's, there's always this frustration that uh, there are species, especially those uh, below 100 grams, uh, for which there's far less knowledge. Um, but the tag size has uh, decreased a lot with, uh, with the years. So. Uh, little by little, you know, it has become possible to track also these uh, smaller species, but with a constant worry that uh, by doing so, you know, we would have a significant impact on, on the birds. So there was, and there is still always a balance between what you can do uh, technically and what you, you should do uh, ethically. Uh, so with the storm petrels, I was very excited already a while ago to, uh, to see the first uh, tracking studies on uh, leeches storm petrels. Um, in, uh, in North America, uh, which revealed a lot using uh, GLSs, um, revealed a lot of things about their, their migrations uh, and more recent uh, tracking studies on, on GPS about the, the closer range. Uh, but there was a lack of knowledge about uh, storm petrels in, in Europe, um, on the Atlantic side and also in the Mediterranean. And so the two, um, the two studies uh, I had in mind today, I don't know whether Grant put online the two uh, references, but uh, there was one by uh, Mark Bolton um, in, uh, in Shetland, uh, tracking storm petrels there, and then another one um, by Spanish colleagues, and I'm very sorry, I don't have the name of the first author. And, it's and was, Andrew Rock. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, so uh, yeah, you'll yeah, have to- I'm probably it. butchering it too. <laughs> yeah, it's Roger. Um, which uh, tracked uh, uh, storm petrels in, in the Mediterranean and uh, with GPSs. And in, in both cases, I think the, the interest of these studies um, is that they reveal that the storm petrels were not there where they're supposed to be, uh, not based on, on at sea observations and not based on models of their, of their distributions. And, uh, and probably one potential reason is that uh, these, these birds are active during the day and at night. So that means that by direct observations, there's a whole part uh, of their behavior that you, uh, you never capture. Um, 
The other thing, of course, is that, and this was, I think, expectable by uh, in Storm Petrels, that the performance in terms of uh, range at sea was, was much higher than uh, what was previously thought. So you come from a range of a few hundred kilometers to over a thousand kilometer um, uh, range. Um, and, and finally, the good news was that in both studies, uh, the impact of the actual GPS tags, which were a bit less than, than one gram, uh, was, was not measurable at the scale of, of, the, uh, of the study, or at least not drastic. And that was my main worry with storm petrels, because they are so small. I thought, well, people will be able to track them, but probably you know, the, uh, the impact will be, uh, will be huge. So, um, so I was excited to see uh, the, uh, the two studies and, uh, and the outcomes. And, uh, and I think in terms of, of uh, MPA design, uh, they, they do have uh, implications and uh, maybe Grant will have uh, uh, things to add in, in that perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just quickly go over the, 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 the Spanish paper for the Med Mediterranean because I thought um, that one there sort of touches on a lot of the issues uh, that David has mentioned here. You know, the storm petrels, of course, being small birds, as David has said, said they, they've only recently begun to be tracked with proper GPS devices. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like actually in the paper. Um, I'll share my screen here now the once. Um, and obviously, you know, this is because that, you know, technology has only recently gotten to a point where it can be deployed on small seabirds. Um, and the ramica ramifications of this is obviously that storm petrels have widely been ignored in SPA planning. And that's simply because we don't know where they go when they leave the colony, um, you know, other than the modeling work that's been done. So this paper um, aimed to deploy these very small GPS units on Europe's smallest seabird, which is the European store petrel. Now these are these units are about 0.95 grams, so really, really tiny. Um, now, more specifically, in in this paper, the goal was really to identify the main foraging areas. That, um, uh, as well as trip characteristics of the of this Mediterranean subspecies, while also assessing any of the impact potential negative impacts on the birds after GPS deployment. So, although the goals of the study are relatively straightforward, there are some big implications towards tracking storm petrels, uh, and that would fill quite a large gap in the knowledge of pelagic seabird distributions, and specifically for SPA development. Now, the authors in this paper tracked 43 birds from Benidorm Island. And of course, I'm probably butchering this name, so I apologize, um, in the Western Mediterranean. Um, and from those, they, they were able to obtain 22 complete foraging tracks. Um, they get into the methods as to why they were only, to get, only able to get 22 foraging tracks. Um, part of it has to do with tag um, failure and like, and I'll, I'll explain that in just a second. Uh, because there is actually some interesting lessons to, to be learned in, in the paper from their, uh, from their, um, their few failures. It's, it's quite cool. Um, so the other kind of interesting thing about this island is that it's been well studied. Um, so it, what it means is that the life history of the individuals is relatively easy to track. And that allows the, allowed the authors to better control for some of the parameters that might impact foraging activity. Mm -hmm. So for example, mm -hmm. age. But using that knowledge, they equip GPS devices only on experienced birds, so those who have bred at least once in previous years. And they also selected breeding birds that were greater than 28 grams in weight and have been incubating for at least 10 days. So they picked birds that they knew were successful. Um, then they used some molecular analysis to sex the birds to make sure that they had a reasonable uh, split of, uh, of male and female birds. I think they ended up with 13 males and 13 females that they were able to use, um, use the uh, tracks from. So, so one of the cool things I thought in this paper is that they describe, um, they, they sort of describe some of the failures they had when they were launched, when they were trying to deploy the tags. And I thought, and I thought I'd just read this directly from the paper because it, it, if for those of you who might be interested in tracking storm petrels in the future, it's probably uh, it's probably good stuff to know. And in fact, I I kind of wish that more papers were were a little bit more explicit in their failures because I think there's a, there's a lot of things that would have saved some of us during our our degrees. Um, so from the paper, it reads, at first deployment, GPS loggers were set to record a location every two hours. Using this set in the battery level on recovery was still high. Consequently, we increased the frequency of locations to one per hour. 63% of the tracks recorded were incomplete. And this is when they increased the frequency of locations to once per hour. 
what what ended up happening is this temporal failure of loggers was due to humidity affecting the devices. To minimize this problem from June 5th onwards, metal terminals of the devices were sealed using silicon grease and the proportion of incomplete records dropped to 10%. So it's one of these sort of lessons learned, lesson learned paragraphs that um, I think for those of you who are doing any tracking stuff um, should, should pay attention to with these new tags. Um, they're, they're quite small and obviously a bit, uh, a bit finicky in, in their deployment. So getting into the analysis, I mean, again, like I said, this is a relatively straightforward paper. Home, home ranges were generated using kernel density estimation, uh, calculating the 95% utilization distribution area. Um, trip characteristics were measured using first passage time analysis, which broadly estimates if birds are resting or foraging, um, or resting, foraging, or transiting. And um, that's done, usually, for those of you who are familiar with the aid habitat um, package in R, that's, that's what they used. It's quite a, quite a handy package. Birds lost on average about 0.91 grams, so less than a gram when recaptured. So that's about 3.25% of their average body weight. So for a 90 kilo human, who's, that's approximately 200 pounds for the Americans and Canadians in the room, uh, that's about three kilos or 6.6 .6 pounds. So all this loss wasn't st statistically significant. However, it does slightly suggest that there could be some immediate negative consequences to deployment. However, it's clear that the sort of more data would be required here to make any, any real assessment. They would have to put these out for longer periods of time. They obviously only put them out for a single foraging trip per individual. So um, interestingly, and, and perhaps unusually, breeding success was, success was higher for the captured birds than the mean of the whole colony. And I do have a, uh, an open discussion question. I'll, I'll ask about that very shortly. Before I do that, I just want to share the screen with you guys to show you this, uh, show you some of the outputs in the paper if you haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, just because I thought it was quite interesting that uh, the the way some of these um, outputs came together. So share my screen. Uh, hang on, I got to pick the right one here. Screen two, must be it. There we go share that. Okay, so you should be looking at the paper there now. Um, and the first thing I wanted to point out here was the direction of the tracks. I mean, every single one of the birds they tracked, save for one, all went down into this sort of western section of the Mediterranean here. Um, and when you can see these huge distances that these birds were traveling um, outwards of up to 900 or so kilometers. And I believe we go down to this table here, you can see that the mean foraging total distance traveled ended up being just about not a thousand kilometers, which is quite far for a very, very small bird. Um, certainly leeches, storm petrels, similar. So um, what I want to do as well is come on down to this, which is the outputs of their kernel density estimates. And if you look at this, you can see here the areas that were identified in this top panel here are just the overall locations, so where they were flying. And you see there's this big blue spot, so this is the intense area around the Cartagena Canyons, and then just down here uh, in the El Barn Sea. So that green area there, that's the, that's the current marine IBA that exists, and there you can see there's, there's no overlap mm -hmm. basically with this utilization area. And then what you're seeing here are the foraging points as uh, as identified by the first passage time analysis. And again, no overlap with this um, marine protected area, which is just quite interesting. So I had a couple of open discussion questions I wanted to drop onto the crowd. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen here. Um, here we go. So. Um, and in fact, Ingrid, yeah, I see your I see your question here, and this is exactly the the question that I wanted to pass out to uh, to the audience to start with, which was about this greater success rate for track birds. And and I my my sort of thinking on this was exactly the same: was that they they selected experienced birds. Now they only selected a very small subset of birds. Is the is the um, is the question here? So the overall the the across the entire colony, it seemed that um, the, the breeding success was a little bit lower. So does that mean that the breeding success across much of the colony was already quite low and they just happened to pick very good birds? And David, I, I reckon you probably have the same kind of opinion on this, hey? No, I, I, I think, uh, well, my understanding was that it was, it was a, a strategy 
um, uh, whereby they wanted, uh, so to say, better individuals because, because they thought, well, you know, we'll do something which may have an impact on the bird. Uh, so let's try to find those which will cope the best uh, with, uh, with that sort of, of disturbance. That, that, would be, uh, that would be my reading of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and mine as well. But is there any, and I don't know, I'm, I'm, I, I haven't looked too much into it. Maybe someone has an opinion on this as to whether or not there are, uh, there would be an effect from where those birds were tracked from. So for example, if they didn't randomly, just randomly select experienced birds from around the colony and they only picked one area, for example, did that, is that one particular subcolony more successful than other parts of the colony? Well, when um, well, I don't know uh, specifically um, uh, about storm petrels in in um, in other large uh, seabird colonies, you know, there were uh, mixed results. Uh, for instance, when you when you test subcolony effects in northern gannets um, with respect to spatial ecology, you don't really find differences. Uh, but but in in other species, there were there were slight differences. So yep. uh, it yeah, it I guess it it varied from one species to, to, the, to the other. I, th I think uh, in, in a way, yes, the authors uh, bias the results by doing so, but at the same time, you know, I can understand uh, the, the logic uh, uh, behind, uh, behind the strategy. If, you, if you're starting with a sensitive species and you don't really know what will be happening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And actually, that, that being said, I did. I forgot to mention that I forgot to show that picture that I wanted to show. So I just share my screen really quick as to what this attachment looks like, um, which is right here. For those of you who haven't seen the, uh, you can see it's it's attached much similar to, to most GPS devices, but uh, you can really see the size here compared to the uh, the author's hand. It's really quite a tiny device. Um, I believe it's just attached with Tessa tape from the seams of it. I think they were careful. They were careful in that sense that you see that they they used the Tessa tape, but not that much. And I think the rationale was that if they would fail to uh, find the birds again, the uh, the device would fall off. Yeah. Uh, and um, so I, th I, th I found yeah I found this quite clever. Yeah. So it was it was attached fairly well, but not so that you know it would stay forever on 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 the bird. That's probably a good strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so. that's right. And there's also, as Virginia pointed, there's also a mass issue. Uh, and this is, this is uh, underestimated in many studies where you actually only get a tag mass um, and, and then you sort of forget about the mass of the tessete. Yeah. And, and with such a small device, of course, you know, they, yeah, you end up with, uh, with more mass for the tessa than for the device. Yeah, I, and certainly, I mean, it is, uh, the device itself with the Tessa tape, I think ended up being 4%, approximately 4% of the average body size, which is quite interesting. Um, and they, I mean, I guess that leads to, th that's another discussion for another time about what's, you know, we, we obviously use this 4% threshold to come up of a few, uh, a few studies, but um, my, I'd be curious to see what would have happened if they had left this device on the, on the birds for longer, if they would have lost more mass. Um, so the next, if nobody else has got any points on that, I think the, the other kind of larger and perhaps more contentious point I want to make here um, is about MPAs and with regards to storm petrels. Um, so I kind of, I don't know, maybe maybe I'll, I'll ask the question broadly and see if anyone pokes their hands up and then Davi, if nobody does, you can, you can kick in. But my question is, is are MPAs actually important for storm petrels? I mean, this is a, these are a, a small species that forage on a very, very, um, very, very small uh, prey item that's not necessarily, may not necessarily be impacted by fisheries. So if they're not being impacted by fisheries, um, other than say being attracted to fishing vessels, um, will an MPA actually make any difference when this species is probably more likely impacted by terrestrial predators or climate change? So if anyone has got a point on that, that would be, that would be great because I'd love to hear people's opinions on, on this. I'm sure somebody has got a political opinion to, uh, to address here. And, and while people think about it, um, maybe the, the interesting point is that in, in Mark Bolton's paper uh, for the um, 
the storm petrol extract from uh, south of Shetland, he, he showed a lot of overlap between the home range uh, oil and gas exploitation. So in, in, in that case, you know, you do have a point uh, of, of declaring these areas as sensitive because of the risk of oiling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To which you know, storm petrols are vulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. And so, but then, you know, if, if you're I guess the planning around an SPA when it comes to oil and gas might be it might be a little bit different because the the way the oil oil flows using it, um, you know you wouldn't necessarily want to put a big SPA that just has some buffer zone around um, around an oil platform when all the oil may all just shift north and so the I guess that's part of the part of the point of doing some interesting tracking studies and and looking at um, uh, and looking at modeling, and particularly current modeling. Oh, hello, Mariana. You've got a question or a point. I'm going to try and unmute you here. There you go. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> hello. <laughs> yeah. More. More actually, uh, a thought. Uh, I have very little experience with uh, with marine protected areas and things like this. But what I was thinking is more the size of the area they are actually using is actually a problem for for defining marine protected areas. I mean, we are we already have problems uh, in uh, um, moving them and considering like for aging grounds or wintering grounds or migra migratory corridors and all these things for marine protected areas and having a species that uh, is still like has this uh, huge uh, area is 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 also going to be a problem so that's also like the, the, the point that i wanted to make is also the area i mean the, the map is really huge mm -hmm. and, yeah yeah that's right and obviously it'd be be the, the other challenging thing is obviously it's it, this is only one species they're looking at here and and no or very few governments are going to are going to step in and be like okay let's protect this whole area for one single species um no it's very nice then you have a you have a perfect uh, umbrella species to protect an entire marine ecosystem yeah i know right <laughs> if only um oh uh Dan Dene, I sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Uh, this species says in the chat, this species is also is also at risk from mammalian predators. Fishermen use the islets and stay overnight, thus increasing risk of in invasion. So MPAs might help in this respect. I I guess is there um is there a bit have there have there ever been his a history of 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 fishermen and the like using the island or using leech storm petrol eggs for for food? I feel like that'd be a very very small meal. I'm, I'm wondering, um, and I have no idea about it, is, is, there, uh, is there knowledge on the incidence of uh, ship traffic uh, on, uh, on, the, on the storm petrols? Any, any incidents? Uh, it's a good question. I, re I, I really wonder whether you know, this, would be, this would be a point yeah, uh, in favor of, of uh, protecting certain areas. Possibly. I mean, I, I see where you're coming from, and certainly, like, if you've been on a ship at sea at nighttime in areas where there are lots of storm petrels, um, if you're stopped or, or hove to, you, you almost guarantee that you're going to get storm petrels on the deck or striking the boat. Um, and I've certainly more than once have seen have seen dead storm petrels on the deck from from hitting the boat too hard. And, and perhaps um, an MPA might be effective for storm petrels if it prevented fishing boats from leaving their their lights on overnight I guess and more I guess in more to the point I guess it would be sort of in squid fisheries and stuff where they use really strong lights at nighttime to attract the prey to the surface um, those those might be um, might be things that would impact impact birds at sea um, nobody else seems to have a point there so I think what well, there's there's one oh we got oh here we go yep there's a whole text in the chat <laughs> yes, Hamza has written, although the area has some MPAs, at the same time there's big fishing area for Spanish fisheries. Quote from the report by UNEP Center for Mediterranean, the following. Surface long lines set in the open sea from the Alboran Sea to catch swordfish, bluefin tuna, or albacore stretch up to 40 miles and contain hundreds of baited hooks that accidentally kill and catch and kill sea turtles, marine mammals, and seabirds. And yeah, that I mean, it's true. These these long lines can be absolutely massive. I do wonder if storm petrels would be impacted by uh, baited hooks. I I would think not. Yeah. 
Virgi Virginia is waving her hands frantically at the screen, so I assume she's got a uh, a point to make. Yeah, although I think it's similar to what, what David was going to say. I, we are a microbe group studying at the moment, the interactions between different species of seabirds and, and fisheries. I don't believe, at least in the Mediterranean, the, the bait they use for the long liners are not, their, their size is too big for them to be a prey for, for uh, storm petrels. They wouldn't be able to fit there in their mouths or in their bodies, actually. But, but uh, yeah, I don't know, regarding the MPAs and whether they are useful for storm petrels or not. I mean, they cannot get by caught in long liners because of the size of the bait, but they can get entangled in, in nets, for mm. example. And so uh, an MPA well-placed, it doesn't need to cover the entire distribution. You just need to focus that in the areas where they forage, which seems to be around the Alvaran Island pretty much. So if a well-placed MPA there that would uh, protect them from entangling and from oiling and from, uh, I think those would be the main at sea threats. Uh, yeah, I also agree that uh, protected colonies would be much helpful for these species. All right, so I have just one last little point to, to bring up here for discussion before we, we end it off. And that's basically around uh, sort of a limitation I saw of this, of this study, which was that they are, they're obviously only tracking um, one colony. And if you look, and if you remember that map I just pulled up, all of the birds went to that Western section of the Mediterranean, whereas, but European storm petrels are distributed right throughout the entire Mediterranean. So there's obviously a whole, um, a whole section of the, the Mediterranean has been ignored in this case. And I do wonder if um, in, in, it's difficult to make a, a case for an MPA when you're only subsampling uh, the larger population. And this may only be this one particular colony might be going to this area. Now they do make a point in the paper of mentioning that this is an important colony in the Mediterranean. Um, but I, I, I do, yeah, I, I, I do worry a bit about studies that might generalize to these areas when they've obviously only included uh, one foraging trip for you know 22 individuals um, and then highlighted this area as a potential as a pot potential important area when it's only one year of data so obviously it's a it's we need to make the case to to do a lot more tracking as we as we normally do in these sorts of uh, in these sorts of papers but um, I'm just wondering if anyone has any ideas um, about the distribution of these birds in general. Are there other hotspots that have been identified in other papers um, that that were different from this? And I'm not familiar enough with the European storm petrel literature to uh, to make an assessment of that. And and oh, uh, yeah, while people think of, think about it, you know, I'll I'll, I'll make the point that. Um, in, in this context, you know these uh, these zone ranges they are they are quite repeatable and uh, at the scale of one colony, you know once you tracked uh, as you say 20, 30 birds, you, you generally have uh, you often have a really good idea of what's going on. And then if you can make the point that that particular colony uh, is uh, is an important proportion of the overall population, then then I you know I still think that that. A single tracking study uh, does uh, does have a, a lot of, of value. Um. Mm -hmm. um, and Ingrid Ingrid does say here, um, leeches storm petrels foraging area is very colony specific, uh, with a lot of segregation in the Northwest Atlantic. I do wonder if that's if that's a similar case here. I do do you know if there's any do we know if there's any uh, much mixing between colonies at all um, in in the Mediterranean? I don't, I, again, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with the literature to make an assessment, but I do wonder if there's any mixing between, um, between some of the nearby colonies. Just a thought for those of you who might be listening and, and listening in later on, something, something for you to mull over in your brains. Oh, and Antonio says, I think the Sicilian channel is an important area for the species as there are important colonies in Sicily and Malta. Ah, okay. Yeah, there are, there are also uh, storm petrol studies from Sicily. Yeah, 
uh, there's a, the, uh, yeah, the, the it's also um, breed in a cave. Uh, there has been some work uh, done there, and it seems to be a fairly important colony. Okay. But I, I can't remember the figures. Yeah, and, and Hamza has posted a, a link down in the chat for those of you who are interested to a marine ornithology paper, um, which is Partial Migration in the Mediterranean Storm Petrel by Paulo Lago. Okay, another another one for read. Thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for posting that there, Hamza. All right, I think with that, it is now um, five after six my time, which means it's time for me to turn into a pumpkin. And um, I think with that, I will say thank you, David. Um, thank you to Stefan and Verena for joining us today. It was uh, nice to have your, you along. And it was nice to see everybody. We had a, quite a good crowd today. It was just over 60, 63 people. So it was good, um, good to have everyone out again. And um, I think what we're going to be doing from now on is um, going back and forth um, between uh, every other week. So it won't be it won't be every week as we did in the past. It'll be um, it'll be every two weeks. Oh, Hamza, you you want to say something? Um, you can say something if I if you want to unmute yourself. Just just very short. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine, Hamza. Okay, it's one a.m. in Malaysia. Oh, so, um, oh you're uh, brave, my yeah, friend. Just mentioning um, storm veterans in Malta uh, recalled me a dear friend who passed away two years ago, Joe Sultana was the founder of BirdLife Malta, mm. and he have done a lot for these species and for other species of seabirds in Malta and in the Mediterranean. He is the guy who uh, pulled my leg to seabird research in 2005. Oh. So uh, I just remembered him, and uh, I don't know, whenever the, somebody says something about Malta, I remember this guy because he, is, he was the father, really, of, of uh, BirdLife Malta since 1967. Wow. He passed away two years ago. Thank you very much. And it was a very interesting session and we'll come back. And Thank happy birthday. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Nice to hear. Thanks a lot. Yep. Very, very cool. Yeah. Thanks for that, that great discussion today, everybody. And uh, yeah, we'll, um, we'll be back again in two weeks time. And and I just like to announce that uh, I, I don't know if you can see, but to the left of me on my screen, I've got Marianta, Mariana. And Mariana will be joining David and myself in a more active role uh, in the future. So you'll you'll see her face around um, gabbering with me and David a little bit more frequently. So with that, um, take care, stay healthy, and stay safe. Avoid that uh, that nasty bug out there at the moment. And we look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks. And take bye now. Stay safe. I'll, I'll dream about storm petrels uh, riding the waves everywhere in the Mediterranean. <laughs> You don't do that every day anyways? <laughs>